Uh, I was asked to, to say something about Anna Örtegren and um, the contacts I've had uh, with her. And um, it started five years ago. And uh, she was like a, a good fairy, one can say, that guided me into the uh, ME field. Uh, very considerate, very knowledgeable and also a kind person. So uh, that was um, a very good introduction to ME, one can say, and also to patient advocacy and uh, collaboration between researchers and uh, patients, which was sort of new to me. Uh, and I like this uh, collaborative approach. So uh, we, uh, in the Swedish and also international networks on ME exchanged lots of emails and uh, she was always helpful and sent good suggestions and um, found new research uh, that we should know about. And then uh, the emails that were coming rather frequently, they stopped and later I understood why. Uh, and uh, so she had this intense pain, intractable suffering, and it was very understandable that she could not continue. So um, we, we should uh, uh, remember her as a very good proponent of the ME course. Thank you very much for that, to, that, that note about uh, a fine woman who we miss. And we're very pleased to say we are dedicating this talk, this lecture, from uh, Theo Harris from Tufts University in Boston to Anne. So, Theo Harris, please. Uh, dear patients, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very humbled and honored to have been asked to give this lecture in memory of this incredible uh, lady. And uh, I hope that what I will tell you will at least um, generate interest in a direction that clearly was related uh, to her illness and, and maybe give us uh, new hopes uh, for the future. Uh, everything that I will tell you, and I will give you an earful, uh, can be found actually on that website. And if that's not enough, uh, then you can visit YouTube uh, on a documentary called My Mystery Symptoms and Mast Cells. Uh, it might take a week for the, today's presentation to go on the site, but you will get it. So I will tell you about this particular cell type, mast cell, that some of you may have heard about. Um, the cell is involved in allergic reactions, but as I will try to convince you, uh, that's basically the tip of the iceberg. And uh, I will develop a hypothesis. I will give you both uh, laboratory and clinical findings. And if I have time very quickly, I might actually give you a personal approach to patient management. Uh, if not, you will find the slides uh, on the website anyhow. So why mast cells? Well, first of all, you can read for yourself. This is an excerpt from what uh, the late Anne actually wrote uh, in her diary. And as you can see, not only she was suffering from everything we know ME does, but she had tremendous sensitivities to numerous things, including all her clothes. So she could literally not wear anything. What she called as allergy, which might not have been exactly allergy, but nevertheless. So I just felt that we owe it basically to her memory, as well as to all patients, to try to find out if there is a connection, and then if there is a connection, uh, see if that can lead us actually uh, to some potential uh, treatment approaches. But that's not necessarily an isolated case. Here are two publications, recent publications, where one, they showed that in fact allergies, or what is called atopy, and atopy or atopic symptoms, is a bigger umbrella than allergy. So the mast cells, as you will see, can respond to allergens, but they can respond to zillion other things. And since we don't have a better word, we call it atopy or atopic individuals. So not only atopy tracts with ME, but the more allergies or sensitivities you have, the more likely that either the symptoms, severity, or the development of the disease will get worse. 
And a paper that was just published, actually, on the lower panel, shows that they looked for the precursors for mast cells. Mast cells are made in the bone marrow, but they travel in the blood, they do not circulate, and then they're home into tissues. So they measured telltale signs on the surface of the precursor cells, and they found that there are actually more mast cell precursors in ME patients. Of course, they don't know where these cells go and what they do, but there's no question that we're getting more and more evidence, in addition to what I will try to propose, that these cells are actually involved. But what do we call allergies? Because some of you may go to an allergist and you present all kinds of symptoms, and they'll say, oh, you've got nothing. Just go and see and shrink, basically. Not that I have anything against psychiatrists. But there are many different things that present as allergies. So allergies, angioneurotic edema, atopic dermatitis, we call it eczema. There's food allergy, there's food intolerance, and all kind of idiopathic things, which means medicine doesn't know what to actually call them. We call them idiopathic. So all of those involve mast cells, but only allergies literally are allergies, yet the mast cells not only participate in all the other diseases, but they're activated by things other than allergens. So you might say, how do we diagnose basically an atopic disease? Well, you can measure all kinds of things in the blood. I'm not going to go through them. The most proper or appropriate way is to collect 24-hour urine. It has to stay cold. And then we measure the breakdown product of two molecules, histamine and prostaglandin D2, because in the blood, they only last about one minute. They're broken down. So it's futile to try to measure them in the blood. But 90% of the time, if a patient shows up to me, and I look at their face, and you see those shiny circles under the eyes, there's got allergic diathesis. I will start digging to find out what actually is happening. And if you actually scratch a patient, either on the back, as you can see, or just on the underarm, in many of these patients, if not most of them, you will get a red welt, as if you were actually stung by, uh, by jellyfish within one minute. That means that the mast cells in the skin respond to pressure, not to allergens. So these are the quick telltale clinical signs that might allow me to start thinking something is going on. So many years ago, we started looking at other diseases long before actually I got involved in ME. I'm a very newcomer in that. And we actually showed that the mast cells are involved in interstitial cystitis, a painful sterile bladder inflammatory disorder, uh, in fibromyalgia, uh, you know, autism. I'll give you some results from autism, et cetera. So, that doesn't mean that the mast cells do exactly what they do in allergy. And as you will see, they can do a number of different things depending what the trigger and the circumstances are. But I learn from patients all the time. And these patients with these complicated sensitivities were coming to me and saying, you've got to write something so that I can actually hand it to my physician and tell them I've got something rather than my being actually sent away. And most of these patients go through 10 physicians in 10 years before they get a diagnosis. So to make a long story short, we published uh, this review in the journal, New England Journal of Medicine. And the center panel is actually from the journal. And it shows the mast cell that can be triggered by environmental factors, everything you can imagine, pathogen, viruses, fungi, all kinds of drugs, peptides released from the brain, growth factors, and the list goes on. A mast cell looks like a soccer ball filled with about 500 of these, I call them ping pong balls. And if you're allergic, let's say to penicillin, they shoot you up with penicillin, it will explode like hand grenade and release the content of which we mostly know histamine. And we give antihistamines to address the histamine after it has been released. We really do not have a very good way of blocking this from occurring. And in many instances, this doesn't even occur. And most importantly for me, that allow me to get into the ME field is that there are many publications that patients with mastocytosis or having more mast cells or mast cells that are super activated, they have cognitive problems, especially brain fog, as we will talk uh, shortly. And this is also taken from the New England Journal of Medicine. I was very grateful to the editors because they allowed us to put the mast cell in the middle and basically indicate that depending what the mast cells release, it can affect every organ of the body, including the brain, which some of the reviewers didn't even want to think about at that time. So what I tell patients now, and this holds true for any other good publication, basically, just takes, take a paper like this to your physician and say, if you don't believe me, just read that first and then I'll come back. Because I tell them it would be very hard for someone to say, well, you know, a review in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, was actually worthless 
And as it turns out, when we actually had the paper accepted, the editors felt that we might get about, you know, maybe 4,000 hits, which is average for uh, a journal. So far, we've gotten 130,000 hits from colleagues, not, uh, you know, patients necessarily, which means that there's a lot of interest that hasn't quite reached all the colleagues yet. So, since then, there has been a new, very useful diagnosis. It is actually in the uh, insurance books, which is called must cell activation syndrome. And what is important is that number one, you don't have to have too many cells, mast cells. You don't have allergies necessarily, but the muscles are activated by everything under the sun, and the diagnosis includes neurological problems for the first time. And all of these patients basically complain of brain fog, as well as things that we see in ME patients, such as diarrhea, flushing, of course. Uh, you know, fatigue, uh, et cetera. And we wrote actually a review that you can see there about brain fog and some inflammatory aspects that I will talk about. But the mast cell is not isolated. It talks actually to macrophages, it talks to T cells that other colleagues have been speaking about, and it has on its surface all the specialized areas we call receptors that can bind and be activated by viruses, fungi, uh, and uh, uh, bacteria, and as you can see, Borrelia, that is important for Lyme, of course, can activate the mast cells. Uh, various fungi can do it, and here's one of many papers where children and adults who were exposed to mold actually had all these telltale symptoms of mast cell activation, and I want to stress, because I won't have time to talk about it today, that mold liberates volatile mycotoxins, cannot be identified, they stick to carpets, clothing, etc. You literally have to leave your home in order to give yourself some time to possibly uh, recover. And mast cells respond to heavy metals, as you can see there, you know, mercury, aluminum, and they respond to pretty much every herbicide that is actually known, including glyphosate, which of course we worry about more and more uh, these days. And the Mastocytosis Society put a DVD a few years ago, and as you can see quite appropriately, they talk about mast cell activation symptomatology and not about allergies. And this is free uh, for physicians and patients basically to get if you visit the website. So why, why do we think that mast cells are involved uh, in, let's say, AME? So the hypothesis is based on where the mast cells are in the brain. And what is fascinating is if you take a cross-section of a blood vessel in the hypothalamus that regulates homeostasis for the body, you can see a red blood cell, the endothelial cell, the pericyte, the two together make up the so-called blood-brain barrier. That's not a wall, it's a set of cells basically. And the mast cell hugs basically the blood-brain barrier. So the caricature is here uh, and there. And we actually believe that the mast cells in the hypothalamus and potentially the amygdala, because we've done a lot of work uh, on autism recently, are involved in developing a localized inflammatory response. And I'll try to explain that uh, shortly. Now, why the hypothalamus? Because strangely, the hypothalamus has as many mast cells per unit volume as your skin, yet the brain doesn't get allergic reactions. So obviously they're doing something there, and the more we can identify they do, the better off will be for a number of diseases, since amygdala regulate behavior and hypothalamus and thalamus regulate, of course, homeostasis, which we know is derailed uh, in ME patients. Now, if we were to look at the muscles, where are they? So if you look after a rat is born, you see that there are very uh, many, actually, in the hypothalamic area shortly after birth. Uh, if you look at them, they piggyback a nerve ending, and this is a blood vessel. And if you look at about 200,000 diameters, you see part of one mast cell, part of another mast cell, and this is a nerve ending with the synaptic vesicles. 50% of each one of these granules is a meat tenderizer. It's an enzyme called tryptase, and of course histamine. So you can imagine if those things were to be released, how much damage they will do to the nerve ending, which might in fact alter uh, the connectivity of the neurons in that area. But we were very interested in stress because many conditions worsen by stress, and we know ME worsens by stress. And what is fascinating is here are some papers, not from us, indicating that major stressors during pregnancy make the baby to be actually more prone to allergies. So no exposure to allergies, just the stress of the mother. And we've shown this uh, and others to happen in rodents as well. And 
There are many epidemiological studies showing that the more atopic or allergic problems you have, the more the child is likely to develop ADHD or autism. So on the one hand, we have stress potentially uh, increasing the possibility of atopic problems, and then atopic problems increasing the possibility of behavioral problems. So how do you study that? And I'll give you just snapshots. So we actually put a marker, technetium gluceptate, which is used also in humans, in the tail vein of a mouse. You put it into a pl plexiglass immobilizer, and I always thought mice like little places, they hate it. So you basically confine the mouse for 15 minutes, and then you sacrifice the mouse and see how much of the tracer got into the brain. And in normal mice, Tons of this comes out in just 15 minutes. These animals are not allergic to anything. We just took them from the cage and put them into the immobilizer. And if we do the same thing in mice that do not have any mast cells, nothing happens. So at least in mice, it appears that the first hormone released under stress, which is called corticotropin releasing hormone, uh, in Europe we call it CRF, in the States we call it CRH, is sufficient to actually trigger the mast cells uh, to open up the blood-brain barrier. And then the question is, is that just enough? Is a hormone enough or do we need more things? And as it turns out, if we actually give CR8 as well as another peptide called neurotensin, this was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, the mast cells release vascular endothelial growth factor, which is actually vasodilatory and opens up the blood vessels and the blood-brain barrier. Of course, if the blood-brain barrier opens up, all kind of toxins, uh, potential pathogens uh, will get in, whether from the environment or the gut. And things get worse, because once neurotensin sees the mast cells, it makes them grow receptors so they can respond to CRH. And when CRH basically gets onto the mast cells, they make receptors for neurotensin. So it's a self-amplifying process that cannot be stopped unless we actually stop the mast cells. And things get even more complicated. In this case, we used actually something released from immune cells called the cytokine or interleukin-33. And when we added it together with another peptide substance P, the mast cells put much, much more vascular endothelial growth factor, which is also vasodilatory, and this was published in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences too. And more recently, uh, also in PNAS, if we add substance PNL 33 you measure TNF, which is one of the most pro-inflammatory cytokines. Substance P hardly puts out anything, L33 a little bit, the two together a thousand times more. So I think it's futile to be looking at just individual triggers, whether it's anemia or other disease. And sometimes it might not be even necessary for individual levels to be increased because the combination of triggers, even at lower amounts, may be sufficient to actually do damage. And the mast cells respond to other hormones that I would not have actually time to go into. This was a recent review we wrote about neuroendocrinology of mast cells. But we measure certain markers or biomarkers, if you wish, in a somewhat related disease that is also comorbid, called, of course, fibromyalgia. And we showed that, in fact, CR8, the peptide substance P, a very structurally related peptide called hemokinin 1 and two cytokines were actually significantly increased in fibromyalgia patients. And we're actually doing this now, comparing fibromyalgia patients to ME patients. In about you know, three, four months, we'll have the results. So as a summary until now, the mast cell can explode in severe allergic reactions, in which case histamine, tryptase, et cetera, are released. But the mast cell can also release a number of cytokines and other inflammatory molecules without ever undergoing this degranulation. However, many times you're fortunate enough to have bright students in the lab. And I remember in the middle of the night, uh, one student said, well, what happens to the mitochondria? And I said, what? They just make energy. Well, he says, what if they do something else? I said, OK, so what, what should we do? And the question was, could they possibly release anything to the outside when the mast cell is activated? I said, OK, that sounds interesting. Well, it generated three patents and about 15 papers. So in confocal microscopy, we can see mitochondria around the nucleus. This is Nomarski optics. It shows a normal mast cell. You can see all the granules. And here are the mitochondria very close to the nucleus. If we stimulate the cell, the mitochondria start moving, actually, which we never knew. I never knew that they can move. And the mast cell, of course, spits out its content. So we decided to see, is that happening just in the laboratory or in humans? So we took a biopsy, basically, of normal uh, patient's skin, 
and you can see the granules of the mast cell. This is the nucleus. The mitochondria in the rectangle are very close to the nucleus. But in eczema, you can see most of the granules have released their content, and the mitochondria are now at the very surface. And when we measured mitochondrial DNA, which is, of course, different than genomic DNA, and that we can identify it, there were a lot of mitochondrial DNA coming out of the cells without the cells dying. So we said, aha, what could that mean? So we isolated the mitochondrial DNA, and we put it on different cell types, and all those cell types were activated. And as it turns out, mitochondria were actually bacteria that became symbiotic with our cells millions of years ago, and their DNA apparently is misconstrued by the body as a pathogen, and it mounts an auto-inflammatory response, which of course would have been impossible for us to identify. And we showed that in fact CRH, together with mitochondrial DNA, increases allergic responses, and here is mitochondrial DNA causing direct toxicity to neurons. So having had all of that, the bottom line is, and many other colleagues have published this, that the mast cells are definitively involved in inflammation and not just in allergic reactions. So we spoke about inflammation, but what is inflammation? Unfortunately, we use the same term to denote different things. So if you have systemic sepsis due to an infection, that's inflammation. We call it cytokine storms. Uh, if you've got uh, encephalomyelitis, it tends to be generalized to the brain. That's how we understand it. If you've got meningitis, of course, uh, it's the lining of the brain. If it is myelin that insulates your nerves, you get multiple sclerosis. So what do we think is happening then in ME? And our take, my take is, that there is a focal inflammation in the hypothalamic area, as I indicated earlier. So if we're talking about myalgic encephalomyelitis, in my mind, it should be encephalomyelitis in the hypothalamus and not necessarily in the whole brain. And what we have not been talking about or studying is actually toxins that are bound, actually, in the environment. We're looking more for viruses and bacteria, but not toxins, which should be an area that we should focus. Of course, there are toxins from various uh, see uh, uh, born uh, sort of organisms and uh, various bites that you can get from spider, mosquitoes, etc., and mold that, as I said, I will not have time to talk about. But a journal called Clinica Therapeutics, right now it's publishing a whole review on the effect of mycotoxins on your psychiatric symptoms, so you might be able to uh, Google it. How do you look at inflammation? The only point I want to make with the slide is that I like to measure pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory molecules, because it is the ratio that tells me much more about what is happening in the patient rather than individual uh, molecules. But at the end of the day, how does inflammation occur in the brain? It can be either local, or there might be materials coming from the blood through the blood-brain barrier, and then affecting the hypothalamus. So we actually made the hypothesis going a step forward that the mast cells they might be regulating the blood-brain barrier, they might be releasing their own uh, detrimental molecules, but at the end of the day, they activate microglia, and microglia are the defenders of the brain. Our brain does not have circulating white blood cells. If the white blood cells get into the brain, they recognize it as foreign, they attack it, that's how you get multiple sclerosis. So the microglia are like spiders with a web, and the neurons grow on the web. If, in fact, the microglia see danger, they start multiplying the, the clones in Star Wars, and they tried basically to confine that area and get rid of it. And what we think is happening is basically you're short circuiting the system. I tell patients the spark plugs are just rusted in that area. So what we have to do is, since we cannot change the spark plugs, remove the rust and give high octane if you wish to allow someone uh, to recover very simplistically. And many papers have been speaking about mast cells talking to microglia in neuroinflammation. But let's assume that something is coming from the periphery. How does it actually get into the brain? Well, the blood-brain barrier might be actually disrupted, and that's how it goes in. But there's another way that it can go in. So there's tiny, tiny vesicles that are released from cells that we never paid attention, actually, many years ago. They're called microvesicles or exosomes. And as it turns out, they carry cargo at various places. And those are so small, they will get through the blood-brain barrier. So the results that I'm showing you here are actually borrowed from a study uh, that's just about to be published in autism, but we're doing the same thing uh, in ME as well. So we isolated these uh, tiny vesicles, and we showed that the total number of vesicles is higher than controls, but as you can see, they can be separated into different groups, which of course we know. These patients, as ME patients, are very uh, diverse. 
And then what we did, which was, I thought, unique, and it was, again, a student that came up with the idea. They said, well, if microglia are involved, what if we take these exosomes and we put them onto the microglia and see what happens? So we culture human microglia in the laboratory. We take the microsomes. We isolate it from in so far autistic patients, but it will be ME patients pretty soon. And we measured the main inflammatory cytokine called interleukin-1 beta. And as you can see, uh, interleukin-1 beta comes out. But we don't know what the cargo is. But since I already told you about the results about mitochondria, we said, could it be that at least part of the cargo might be mitochondrial DNA? So we measure mitochondrial DNA in these microvesicles, and it was actually more uh, than controls. That doesn't mean to say that we have a biomarker yet, but at least it gives me something to hang my hat on that we can actually move forward um, and then try to block it. So as I try to wind out, what are the things that kind of we worry about, I worry about, and many of these have not actually been investigated in ME. So we worry about things called cahexins that make actually muscle uh, sort of waste away, and you know, therefore you will feel very fatigued anyhow. We worry, of course, about herbicides, heavy metals, inflammatory cytokines, you know, mycotoxins, you know, biotics, you know, the works. And at the end of the day, we really don't know what the connectivity is and what connectivity of the neurons is affected in that area, but there's no question that it is affected. So we've got to find out what is it that affects it, where does it come from, and can we actually block it? So now we're coming to the blocking part. For years, we've been studying a class of molecules called flavonoids. There are about 3,000 in nature. Not all of them are good. And they are very good antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and we showed that they block mast cells and microglia. That's the structure. Another colleague has spoken about luteolin having anti-inflammatory effects. I like luteolin in particular. We won't have time to go as to why that one in particular. But with a little study from NIH a couple of years ago, and there was a doctorate actually of one of my students, we tried to mimic fatigue, not chronic fatigue, and of course not ME in mice. So what we do is we take the mice and we give them what is called poly-IC to mimic a viral infection, and then we put them to swim in cold water. So they're stressed, and they have to exercise to stay afloat. So you basically get three triggers at the same time. And then we measure inflammatory molecules both in the serum and in the brain, and we either give them the usual chow to eat or chow with a flavonoid. And basically what we see, that when we stress the animals or we give them the viral mimic, uh, this, uh, as you can see, go up in the serum, and they're highly expressed in the brain. And when we change the child to contain flavonoids, everything drops down to zero. So at least in animals, in a sort of model uh, of, um, of fatigue, we might be able to at least measure readouts and see that we can actually block them. So we decided to go a step farther. I only have about three slides or so left. And we looked at a molecule that is called methoxyluteolin. So instead of hydroxy groups, it's got methoxy groups. And this is better because it's better absorbed, decreased metabolism. It's actually a methyl donor, which is very good for the brain. We need to methylate. And what we did is we used first mast cells. We stimulate them again with substance P. We measured another enzyme. It's like a cheap surrogate for the tryptase that I mentioned. And you can see that when we stimulate, there's a lot of the enzyme. The only drug that is considered to be a mast cell blocker, chromolin, inhibited a little bit, luteolin inhibited more, and methoxyluteolin inhibited even more. And this was just published, actually, in the uh, Journal of Pharmacology Experimental Therapeutics. And we actually look for the potential target. Uh, and I'll show you one slide of this target. So when microglia, when mast cells, when other cells are activated, basically all kind of signals, starting with calcium influx, go through various kinases. And they converge on something called mammalian target of rapamycin. It was called target of rapamycin because this complex was blocked by an old antibiotic, rapamycin, which, by the way, has been tried in a number of diseases, uh, and it failed because it had horrible side effects. Nevertheless, the laboratory can block. And once mTOR is activated, mast cells and microglia can become super activated and release molecules. We have a natural break to this called P10. And at least 10% of children with autism uh, have a mutation in P10. So the P10 cannot break mTOR, and mTOR works uh, faster. Uh, no one, to my knowledge, has looked actually uh, about this uh, involvement in ME. So when we stimulate the mast cells or the microglia, in this case microglia, with the peptide neurotensin, you measure the phosphorylation of a substrate. There are two substrates as an index of activation. 
And you can see these bands. As long as the bands are dark, that means that mTOR is activated. If you pretreat with rapamycin, you block one but not the other. If you block with methoxyluteolin, you block both. And in fact, when we compared then neurotensin stimulation of microglia and readout of interleukin-1, and we did a dose response using either luteolin or methoxyluteolin, both luteolin and methoxyluteolin blocked actually the uh, microglia release of IL-1. So a summary is that we think that in fact mast cells uh, do talk to microglia. Microglia release all kinds of molecules, some of which can contribute actually to the symptoms of ME. For better or worse, we got a pattern in the use of flavonoids actually uh, in, in treating sort of brain-related inflammation, and I helped develop two dietary supplements that contain uh, luteolin, which of course I will not uh, talk about today. So the remaining slides is a very quick personal approach to some of these patients that might have both muscle-related problems uh, and ME. So first of all, we've got to make sure that we either identify or exclude other diseases that either might be comorbid or that might be confused with ME, because some of them might be treatable at least easier than what we have to offer to ME patients. So that's number one. Number two is that I absolutely, in my book, even though we haven't really discussed this very much, I need to actually make sure that there's no pituitary adenoma or something called hypophysitis. Some of you may not have heard the term, but hypothalamus connects to the pituitary through the median eminence. It's like the pituitary stalk. That can be inflamed, and we call that hypophysitis. And I've seen many patients that have a lot of symptoms and mimic ME and other such symptoms that have hypophysitis. A regular MRI will not be able to see that. So you've got to actually ask for a pituitary MRI with contrast and have someone very uh, you know, knowledgeable read it. Now, short of that, clearly we have to avoid to the extent possible allergens, colorings, deodorants, even electromagnetic waves. I've got lots of patients that are sensitive to life, literally. They go close, close to a microwave and they freak out. They start itching, they turn, you know, they flush. So something is happening. To what extent it might be affecting ME or other diseases, I don't know. We don't know. We swim in these things. And we'll probably find out 100 years from now that maybe they were actually um, affecting us. To the extent that I suspect histamine, and why would I suspect histamine? You might have teary eyes, you might have got itching, you might have got bloating, you might have got diarrhea. There are foods that contain histamine without your necessarily being allergic to anything. So ripe avocado, ripe tomatoes, cheese, sardine spices. So try to avoid those. And there have been some evidence that plastics, preservatives, and of course stress that I talk about are really big uh, items and we should try to avoid them as much as possible. Two slides left. Now, I'm not going to go through all those drugs, but what I want to point out is three things from this slide. And again, this slide would be available uh, to colleagues and others. First of all, there are some supplements, such as, let's say, Brain Gain uh, or Fibro Protect, that contain a number of ingredients in addition to flavonoids that might be very useful. If someone has been exposed to mold or continue to expo be exposed to, to mold, I give them actually caprylic acid, which is a natural molecule and is very good antifungal. If we go to drugs, there are certain antihistamines that are better than others because they have additional properties. So for instance, I love cyproheptadine. It's a very old drug. It exists in the United States uh, as periactin. In the UK, it's under a different trade name. I don't want to mention trade names. But it also entered diarrhea. It's an appetite stimulant, and many of the patients that don't have you know, they're so fatigued that they just cannot eat, might actually feel a little more like uh, eating. And it is very good as a headache prophylaxis, especially for migraines. Probably the best drug I will ever use before I go to super duper drugs for migraines. Doxepin is an old antihistamine, but it's also antidepressant. And it also increases appetite, it's sedating. And then of course, if you've got prostaglandin elevation, to the extent that a patient can tolerate it, you can use ibuprofen or a little aspirin. If, in fact, you've got POTS or dysautonomia and you do not have asthma because it's contraindicated, then you might get a beta blocker such as propranolol. And I always add, actually, ranitidine and antacid to these patients because you've got a serious disease, you're stressed, so your stomach is going to be all over the place anyhow. So it's without saying that I would like to actually cover the stomach. These are the people that actually worked in the studies that I showed you. I get two points, and this is the last slide I want to make. Number one, it was incredibly gratifying that, as we heard earlier, younger students participate in research. The bad part is they all graduated, and I don't have any funding and no more students. 
So it, and it is incredibly difficult to start all over again to sort of indoctrinate in the good sense uh, ma many uh, uh, new students. And all the funding I had, except for a small R21 application from NIH, came from very small foundations. God bless them all, and God bless you all. Thank you. Harris, that's superb. Thank you very much. Thank goodness fish and chips are not on your list, you know. <laughs> Save us the British. I was about to include those. <laughs> you might, don't, ever, don't ever research them, please. <laughs> uh, questions, please. Do you think in this patient it would be interesting to measure the triptasial right. level? Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, would it be useful to measure triptase? As I said, triptase is uniquely found in mast cells. Uh, unless you have systemic mastocytosis, which basically involves two organs and your bone marrow is positive, et cetera, triptase is actually not uh, elevated and it's not part of the diagnosis of mastocytosis either. I think it's a very useful quick test, if I suspect. If it turns out negative, then I look for metabolites in the urine. If it's positive, you buy a biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy. Okay, anyone else? Yes. I had a patient some time ago who told me that the only thing that cured his bone pain was smoking a, a reefer. And um, so clearly cannabis was actually uh, helping him in this situation. I was very interested to see that you uh, shown that flavonoids have at least an anti-inflammatory activity. Um, cannabis oil extract has now become available over the counter in this, con in this country. And I'd be interested to know if anyone here has derived similar benefits. Uh, from taking it, particularly in relation to, to bone pain. Uh, there's a lady here that would yes. like to yes. say a word. I, I, I have a comment to make as soon as we hear from the lady. Hello, yes, I use, I use cannabis oil. You can get it at 5% from Holland and Barrett, it's legal. You can also get it as a vape. I've never smoked in my life, but I've learned to inhale so that I can use cannabis oil as a vape, it doesn't contain THC, which is the bit that gets you high. It only contains CBD, which is an amazing pain relief, and it should be available on the NHS, not just for people with MS, but for people with ME, Parkinson's, and motor neuron disease, at least. Okay. I don't have any experience using it. Um, there aren't any studies that I know, except that I believe, except for seizures, where it seems to work. I'm not against it. Uh, the only thing I would like to point out is, depending where you get it from, uh, and there were two reports by the FDA that many preparations of um, uh, CBD oil came from cannabis that was are allowed actually to be stored and then mold grew on it and it contained mycotoxins. So you just, just be careful that the source is proper. And the same goes true for any flavonoid. Unfortunately, dietary supplements I dare say, except the ones that I helped develop, don't tell you the source of the purity. So for instance, quercetin or quercetin is one of the most popular uh, flavonoids, it's useful, but the cheapest source is actually either peanut shells, and if you're allergic to peanuts, no one tells you that, or from fava beans, and if you're a Mediterranean extraction and you miss the enzyme G6PD, you get hemolytic anemia, and no one tells you that either. So you just have to be very careful what you get and how pure it is. One more. I'm um, Dr. Paolo Brambilla from Italy. I deal with old people, mostly. I'm, I'm a GP. And I was wondering whether flavonoids you are talking about are the normal, usual flavonoids we prescribe to out of old people for vessels because of insufficiency of venous system. So uh, I was also wondering May this be a new road to 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 ride on to I mean for, for research. Should we move our attention to old people and try to get some evidence from there? The second question, which is a second part of the first question, I can say I'm seeing two, three old people who are suffering from a chronic fatigue that I cannot explain and, and going through all the tests. Is there any evidence of, this is a general question, I mean, any evidence of CFS in old people, more than young or adults, as we have said so far? 
the first question is a little easier to answer. So first of all, uh, there are two open label published studies where at least luteolin has been used in children with autism uh, with, I dare say, fairly decent results. It takes about six months to a year to really see a major difference. There were no side effects at all. Um, again, for better or worse, I've been taking one of these formulations ever since I made it uh, six years ago. And all I can tell you is I work 18 hours a day and I think it keeps me going. Now, does that mean that elderly people will get benefit? They will, there's no downside, because basically it's an extra from chamomile uh, and mixed with olive oil to increase absorption. So what I usually say is if it doesn't work, you get a Mediterranean diet in a capsule, basically. So that's the downside. Now, in elderly people, I worry about other things. Uh, there have been a number of studies showing, for instance, that the elderly people that might have had allergies were taking an antihistamine, especially a dosage of about 100 milligrams a day. In the United States, it was actually Benadryl. For more than six months, that affected cognition, basically, and they developed brain fog. So as you can imagine, uh, and as you know, my compatriot, if I can say that, Hippocrates said you know, uh, back then, too much of something is not necessarily good. Uh, so with elderly people, I worry much more. And if they're likely to have any drugs on board, then I really want uh, a gene analysis, especially of the CYP3 genes that metabolize and the, um, uh, the gene that metabolizes catecholamines, uh, methyl orthotransferase, because uh, there can be so many side effects of the drugs they're taking that it would be very difficult to isolate the problem then try to address it. But I'll be happy to talk to you more outside so we can keep on going. Theo Harris, th thank you, thank you. Very, very much thank you. indeed. Bye -bye.